Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Regarding human rights offenses in the occupied West Bank, we hold that the protracted occupation is a source of continued violations of Palestinians' fundamental human rights and must be ended. We work according to the principles of international law, focusing on three main spheres of uh, violations that are occurring regularly in the West Bank. Um, One being settler violence and offenses committed by Israelis against Palestinians in the West Bank. The second is accountability of Israel's security forces for offenses committed against Palestinians. And the third is the takeover of Palestinian lands. About two years ago, we began discussing the possibility of examining the crime of apartheid, um, which at the time was 13 years following our documentation of human rights violations in the West Bank, which is now 15 years, um, and using the legal framework of occupation. We began to wonder if this framework was sufficient to explain the human rights violations that we were consistently documenting. This also came at a time when, for the first time, Israeli officials began to more explicitly state their intention to retain control of the West Bank permanently. The process of um, quote-unquote de facto annexation and also under-the-radar moves towards creating a permanent presence in the West Bank were already underway for years. Um, which Yesh Dean had been documenting for a long time with reports um, such as Under the Radar and from Occupation to Annexation, um, which examined the uh, Levy Committee's recommendations, um, which was a committee that was appointed by the Israeli government to basically um, see how different measures that the Israeli government could take to retroactively authorize um, what was considered unauthorized Israeli construction in the West Bank. Um, But it was in 2017, following the passage of the regularization bill by the Israeli Knesset, the first time the Knesset explicitly legislated over the West Bank, and following numerous outright statements by politicians and officials regarding annexation and intentions, um, and Israel's intentions to create a permanent presence in the West Bank, that we began to be concerned that perhaps uh, the laws of occupation were not sufficient. The word apartheid has been in the discourse for a long time, but has often been misused or casually tossed around. And we wanted to provide a really solid analysis that's deeply grounded, a conservative legal analysis based solely on international conventions and legal frameworks available. So after over 50 years of occupation, we chose to examine whether the laws of occupation um, are sufficient or if another paradigm, apartheid, could explain the situation in the West Bank. I'll let, me, I'll let Michael explain the reasoning behind the geographic scope more, but one of the primary reason, reasons that we chose to stick with the West Bank was that this is Yeshtin's scope of expertise and our mandate, and the area in which we have the most solid information available for a legal analysis. And so the long process led us to where we are now, and I'm going to pass it to Michal to give uh, the full content of the legal opinion which he authored for Yeshtin. Hello, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Gerard, and thank you, uh, Sharona and Munir, for being with me today. And um, <clears throat> I want to thank the hosts um, that convened this webinar. It's really an important topic for, for us uh, at Yesh Dean. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, uh, an important topic for anyone who's uh, um, interested and uh, active uh, in the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Um, I would like, what I'll try to do in the several minutes that I have before I'm passing on to Munir Lohr, uh, would be to try to give, provide a short overview of the legal analysis and the, and the um, um, reasoning behind um, our conviction that uh, the crime of apartheid is the, the international uh, crime against humanity of apartheid is being committed in the West Bank. It is committed uh, by Israelis uh, and its victims are Palestinians. This is basically the bottom line of our report. But before I embark into explaining um, the, um, the reasoning behind uh, that, uh, that led us to this uh, conclusion, this very grim conclusion, I want to make a few preliminary remarks. First of all, it is very important for us uh, 
to make it clear that uh, we do not have the pretension of starting a discussion, a discussion about the nature of the Israeli control in the OPT in general, and over Palestinians, even more Jews in general, is, a, is an ongoing discussion. Um, there were people before us and uh, entities before us. There are many Palestinian scholars, lawyers, and others who have written about and analyzed uh, the nature of the Israeli uh, regime in the West Bank and beyond. And we were, are definitely not the first to use the word apartheid, uh, even in the legal uh, uh, con uh, sense that it has. We're joining an ongoing discussion. We're not pretending to start it, neither are we uh, uh, pretending to be the last voice in it. We're just joining the discussion. It is true, though, that we are the first Israeli organization that joins the discussion, and I think there is uh, uh, an importance uh, uh, in, in that fact. Second, our, our uh, um, report does not name who the uh, perpetrators of the crime of apartheid uh, are. Um, we, we do not have the tools to make a, a, an assertion as to who are the per perpetrators. This is the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, the Foreign Minister, the different generals. In order to make, an a, 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 crimes are committed by people, by human beings, not by states or by regimes. And people are responsible criminally, legally, for crimes. But in order to ascertain who is responsible for the crime of apartheid, uh, a, a, another uh, uh, investigation, a real investigation, has to take place one that we are not capable of doing simply because we do not have the powers to interrogate, to summon, and to detain people in order to question them. We have been able to make the assessment of whether the crime is committed, has been committed, and is still being committed. So that's my second preliminary uh, um, uh, comment. And then to the third and last uh, preliminary comment, and that is about the territorial scope of our research, our study. Our study focuses, as uh, Gerard and Shona have already said, focuses on the West Bank. Um, it was not uh, um, it was not by chance uh, that we disregarded other areas where Israel has all kinds of control over Palestinian lands and over Palestinian people. It has control over Palestinians, of course, in East Jerusalem, in the Gaza Strip that is under um, a uh, more than a 12 years long, um, very cruel siege where Israel controls the borders, the air space. And although it doesn't have uh, a uh, uh, permanent land presence, it does have uh, um, uh, a presence and control, an effective control over that territory. Israel also have control, to some extent, over Palestinian refugees who are not allowed to go back uh, and return to their um, uh, lands. So the question of the scope of the study is very relevant. However, there were several reasons that we've decided to uh, focus on the West Bank. First, as Shona said, this is our mandate. Um, and this is our expertise. We know the West Bank very well. For the last 15 years, we have been very intensively and very intimately uh, working in the, in the West Bank. And we know very well every policy, every practice uh, uh, that uh, Israel uh, and Israeli authorities apply in the West Bank. We represent hundreds, probably even more than hundreds, of victims throughout the, we have represented throughout the years, victims of settler abuse, uh, victims of police brutality and, and military uh, uh, um, um, breaches of rights. And so this is the area that we know best and we can analyze, because analyzing the crime of apartheid needs a very well acquaintance with policies and practices. Um, and this is our mandate also. So that's definitely one reason. But then uh, uh, there is another one. And here I'm getting already into the merits of the report. The crime of apartheid, as Gerard said, has its roots, historical roots, in the very specific generic uh, uh, um, commission of the crime in the South African apartheid in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 
and 80s. But throughout the years when uh, the movement to end apartheid grew, uh, it used legal, um, uh, legal uh, advocacy, uh, among other uh, uh, tools, uh, to put pressure on South Africa to end apartheid. And um, this pressure has culminated into um, international treaties which defined um, what the regi a, a regime of apartheid is and uh, criminalized um, the acts that um, pertain to um, prolong such a regime, to empower that regime, and to maintain it. And so we have two international treaties. One is the uh, Apartheid Convention, the International Convention for the Suppression of the Crime of Apartheid from 1973. 1973. And, then, and, and in that convention, there is a definition, a legal definition of the crime of apartheid. And the crime of apartheid is categorized in that treaty as a crime against humanity. And then we have another treaty, and that is from 1998, after the fall of the, of the South African apartheid. And that is the Rome Statute. Uh, of the International Criminal Court, which defines many international crimes, war crimes, crimes against peace, crimes of aggression, genocide, and crimes against humanity. One of the crimes against humanity listed in the Rome Statute is uh, the crime of apartheid, and it is also defined there. The definition of the crime of apartheid um, is more or less uh, a, an act that is committed in a context of a special regime. And the regime, the regime of apartheid is um, a regime in which one racial group dominates another racial group and systematically oppresses it. I'll repeat that. A regime where one racial group dominates another racial group and systematically oppresses that group. So we have a regime, in a moment I'll say something about the word regime because it will bring us again to the question of the scope of our report. A regime in which there are two racial groups. Racial groups under international law, unlike what people might think, is not about race, not necessarily about race. Because international law divides uh, different hum human groups according not to their genetic or biological uh, 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 or color of their skin, but rather by their social and political identities. It includes race, it includes color, it includes uh, uh, ethnicity, it includes nationality, religion, and all kinds of such uh, divisions. And so there is no question that Israeli Jew, Jews are a racial group and that Palestinians are a racial group. There are two ethnic and national uh, uh, um, categories. Now, we in, the, in, the, in, 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 in Palestine, um, Israel is controlling the West Bank in a belligerent occupation. A belligerent occupation, by definition, is a, a regime, a military regime of domination and oppression. Every occupation is such. Every occupation of people who do not want to be occupied is a regime of domination and oppression. Why? Because international law itself, the laws of war that uh, regulates the situation of, of occupation um, is, um, is um, um, defining the occupier as an authoritarian ruler of the occupied territory. An occupied territory is not a democracy. This is what international law prescribes. And so the, the military commander of an occupied territory embodies the legislator, the executive, and the judiciary for the duration of the occupation. And the occupied people do not have, again, under international law, it's not illegal. This is how international law regulates uh, occupation. The occupied people are stripped of their political rights to vote, to elect, and to be, to be elected and to run for government. It does all that, but with one very important condition. Occupation is not sovereignty. An occupation is temporary. What it means that an occupation is temporary? It means that all parties involved, and primarily the occupying power, in our case Israel, must pursue an end to the occupation. 
it must do everything that it can to end to bring an end to the occupation. Now, not international law does not provide a calendaric date when occupation must end because it realizes that sometimes ending occupation is impractical. But the occupying power must pursue constantly to bring an end to the occupation. So, if we look at the crime of apartheid, we have a, a regime. Uh, in which one racial group dominates another racial group and systematically oppresses it. The, the, the DNA of that regime, the feature that makes it criminal, that makes it illegitimate, is, are two things. One is that it maintains supremacy of one group and coerces inferiority on the other group. How does, how does it do it? In two ways by denying rights to the inferior group and showering the superior group with, with rights and powers and privileges, and by denying resources to the uh, 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 inferior group and diverting all the resources to the supreme group, to the group uh, uh, that has supremacy. The Israeli occupation is not an ordinary, I don't know if there is such a thing, ordinary occupation, but it's unique in the sense that it includes, as you all know, a significant, very important feature, and that is colonization. It's not a military occupation, and that is that. It is a military occupation that in, in which the, the occupying power incentivized for years, and still is incentivizing hundreds of thousands of its own citizens to immigrate into the, uh, 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 the occupied territory, while in, in, in direct and frontal breach of, of, of a clear prohibition in, in, in the laws of occupation. So Israel has created a racial group, a civilian racial group, in the West Bank of hundreds of thousands of Israelis. Israelis who have all the political rights, they have a right to vote and to be elected and to run to government, and they have a share in the processes that that, that tailor the norms that govern their lives and the lives of Palestinians. Palestinians do not have any of these. And this immediately, like a power, like a physical force, created the exact reality that international law wanted to prevent by prohibiting uh, 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 settling an occupied territory. It created a constant diversion of all the resources of the occupied territory to the, set, to the Jewish settlers at the expense of the Palestinians. I'll give you one figure. The main, the most important public uh, resource, land, 99.76% of public lands that have been allocated by the military government during 53 years were allocated to Israelis, 99.76%. Less than a quarter of a percent of public lands that have been allocated in 53 years of occupation have been allocated for Palestinian use. And even then, most of these lands that were allocated for Palestinian use were for Palestinians who were coercively removed from their lands and were relocated in another land to allow uh, expansion of settlement. 200 and something settlements were created in 53 years. Not a single Palestinian village or town was, uh, was acknowledged. I can go on and on and on. There are 59, 60 pages of the report. You can look it yourself. There is absolutely no, no, uh, no uh, 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 dimension of public life that Palestinians have not suffered uh, 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 um, development or even curbing of their development. And, and Israelis were showered with with uh, resources, with funding, and, and, and with rights. And so we have a regime where one racial group dominates another group and systematically oppresses it, and the oppression is also clear. We, are, we have listed in the report the, uh, some of the many uh, 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 legal and other uh, coercive tools that are applied, employed by the of Israel authorities against Palestinians who want to uh, uh, criticize the government, want to organize, to, assert, to create, uh, to uh, establish associations, you name it. Political, uh, uh, political activity by Palestinians is intolerable and is met with 
uh, with a blatant force by the Israeli uh, 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 state and by the Israeli authority. So what we have is basically a regime where one racial group, as I said, dominates and oppresses systematically another racial group. Now, where does that regime take place? And this is what the question of why we chose the West Bank. International law does not, um, does not define what a regime is. And in order to understand what a regime is, one needs to go and look for the, uh, for the uh, um, content of that concept in other disciplines, in political science, in history. And basically, a regime is the totality of public authorities that have power to make decisions and implement and carry them out of a normative framework of laws, bylaws, directives, a normative framework of policies and of practices. All of this together is a regime. And when I say that, that means that there are different resolutions. When you look at the, at the, at, at the uh, uh, Israel-Palestine map and you ask yourself, okay, so what, what is the regime here? Well, one can say, there is one political power between the Jordan River and the sea. And that's the government of Israel. So that's the regime. The regime is the, is the government of Israel with all its powers and, and different authorities in different areas. That's one option. And this is an option that we do not deny that can be the uh, 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 focus of study. But then if we look closely, at the, we took a lens of a higher resolution, we can see that yes, there is one political power and that means that that political power is morally and legally responsible for everything that is done in all of the land. But there are two sets of public authorities, of governments, of, of uh, laws, uh, of normative framework, of policies and practices. One in the 1949 ceasefire line borders, or the Green Line, uh, which I will term Israel proper, where you have a um, parliamentary civilian uh, uh, regime. And then you have in the West Bank a military regime. And you have in the Gaza Strip a siege, which is a completely different method. So it is possible to, to uh, make a choice about what in what scale you want to uh, uh, study the issue. As we said from the outset, we have made the choice, it's a choice, to look at the West Bank because we know it so well and because there is a big community of Israeli settlers there, which creates a reality of two racial groups, a real reality in the same area. But East Jerusalem is the same. And East Jerusalem should be the focus of probably our next report, or someone else's report. Uh, and th there are many who say that Israel in itself should be also scrutinized through the lens of the crime of apartheid. Although whoever will do that study will have to um, confront with the question of whether when the, the inferior racial group, and in this case it's the Israeli the Palestinians with Israeli uh, uh, citizenship, and they have the right to the political rights to vote, uh, to be elected and to run for government, does that still is so diluted, so uh, uh, um, um, worthless that you can still uh, um, ascribe to that regime uh, a systematic, uh, the, the degree of systematic discrimination and oppression that is needed for the crime of apartheid? So throughout the years, Israel, and, and now I'm getting to the last, you know, we've gone through the issue of having two racial groups under one regime where one of the uh, racial groups is uh, 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 superior to the other and coerces inferiority over the other and uh, dominates the other and, 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 and systematically discriminates. It. That is an apartheid regime. That is not the crime of apartheid. That is an apartheid regime. And an apartheid regime is illegitimate and must end. But the crime of apartheid is committed when people, human beings, usually leaders, people in, in, in places of, uh, uh, of power, generals, when they 
may, when they commit um, what international law calls inhuman acts, inhuman acts, in the context of such a regime, and with the intention to maintain that regime, to perpetuate it, to make it eternal. Because such a regime of domination and oppression is still not apartheid if it doesn't have the pretension to be eternal. If it's something temporary, if it's something temporary, then it is not, it is many things, maybe other crimes. There is definitely racial discrimination here, maybe persecution. There are many other options and even criminal options. But it's not apartheid. Apartheid is only, the crime of apartheid is only committed when you have this special intention to perpetuate that uh, illegitimate regime. And the inhuman acts that are committed uh, are ones, basically, that are, I, I can't go into all of this because it's a very complex matter, but, but, but very roughly I would say that inhuman acts um, are mainly acts to deny um, human rights, basic human rights, from people because and according to their group affiliation. So a decision by uh, an Israeli official to deny rights from Palestinians while allowing them to Israelis with the intention of perpetuating the regime in the West Bank with all the character that I've described will make that official responsible for committing the crime of apartheid. Now, throughout the years, Israel has always said, when leveled with a, with a charge that it uh, uh, is uh, responsible for the crime of apartheid, Israeli governments have always said, we do not have that intention of maintaining, of perpetuating our uh, uh, domination over the Palestinians. This is a temporary situation. We want to have a peace negotiation with the Palestinians. We want to get to an agreement. And when we we'll have that agreement, they will be masters of their own fate. We do not want to rule them. That was the Israeli uh, slogan. And it started in 1967. The Israeli foreign minister in 1967, Abba Evan, already said things of that sort in the Security Council debate. Um, that took place in November of, of that year and ended with the adoption of Resolution 242, the very important Resolution uh, 242. And since then, for 50 years, all Israeli governments have said, we want to have peace. We want to have a peace process. We, want, we don't have a partner. We do have a partner. But basically, we do not want to, to, to control the Palestinians and dominate the Palestinians. These words, of course, collide with the deeds of all governments, and everything they've done on the ground was the complete opposite, the complete opposite. Changing the landscape, uh, creating a, a Jewish uh, 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 settlement, huge enterprise, all of that show is, is our circumstantial evidence, very, very uh, a powerful circumstantial evidence that Israel was striving to eternalize its presence and domination over the land and the people. But you know what? We don't need that anymore. Because in the last three years, since 2017, since Trump took power and Netanyahu was able to take his real policy out of the closet, we are no longer facing with words that say something different than the deeds. Israeli governments are pursuing, in the language of uh, Netanyahu, a gradual annexation policy, a policy of gradual annexation, which means Israel is openly stating that it desires, it is striving to eternalize its uh, control over the land, the West Bank, and its people. And so, by its own words, the Israeli government has shattered the only alibi that it might have before. Now, I want to leave as much room as possible for Munir to, to speak. So I will stop here, although I can speak for another two hours easily. Uh, and I'll pass the floor to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Michael. Um, I'm sure that you can talk for two more hours. Um, and thanks for this very uh, passionate um, and, and very um, good uh, presentation. It gives a lot of, of, of information. And I, um, 
I see already quite some questions coming in. So, um, uh, yeah, I think it was very good. Um, I would like to give the floor now to, um, or the screen to Monir. Monir, it's you. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gerard, and uh, many thanks also to uh, Sharona and Michael uh, for your uh, presentations and, uh, and, and for your work. Allow me to start my timing and to start my screen sharing. Okay. So uh, again, uh, again, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for hosting me and uh, for this uh, important um, um, event that you are conducting. Um, and uh, also the very important topic uh, uh, that we are discussing today um, regarding apartheid uh, in the West Bank, as um, the report of um, yes, Dean has uh, explained. But my presentation is uh, to go a little bit beyond the uh, report of, of, of yes, Dean. So um, I, I do recognize and agree with and, uh, and accept the uh, results that were concluded uh, by the Yesdin report um, that there is indeed apartheid in the West Bank and apartheid regime in the West Bank. Uh, but in this, I'm also going to offer a, a, a wider uh, scale. And this is because um, the way I see um, the um, Yesdin report is like a piece of the puzzle. So yes, Dean has explained, uh, both Sharona and Michael have explained to us uh, that their um, choice to write a specialized report on the West Bank and uh, to analyze apartheid in the West Bank is because yes, Dean's uh, mandate is in the West Bank excluding Jerusalem. Uh, and therefore, the information and the material that yes, Dean works with is their own information. So um, in, in that way, I see uh, this uh, important report as uh, only a part of the puzzle. Uh, the big picture uh, includes this, certainly, but can only be complete when we can see other elements and other geographical areas and um, uh, older and newer and different types of violations that uh, cross actually with this, uh, with whatever has been discussed in the report, however, can be different in some cases. Uh, so my uh, presentation will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, to try to, I, I will not complete the puzzle because it needs much more research and much more work and much, uh, and a much bigger presentation again, but I will try to give examples of how apartheid might also be seen as uh, one of the features of the Israeli uh, regime in general. And, uh, but I, I, would sh I should also recognize that I see this report uh, of Yesdin as an important step forward coming from uh, an Isra Israeli organization. I know that Israeli organizations and individuals and uh, uh, from left and right have been uh, looking at the term apartheid as, as a taboo. Uh, even people would not say the term, they would say the A word. Um, and uh, uh, it's a taboo, it's something that people don't want to talk about because it undermines uh, the state or the regime. And it has been the main feature of discussing uh, human rights in Palestine has been by looking at certain violations, measuring them against certain standards of international law, finding that these are actual violations and calling for their stop or for the reparations, etc. But it is very important at this point. Um, and in fact, it has been important, but it continues now to be important to look at the whole regime because we cannot solve the problem unless we manage to find what it is to actually uh, diagnose this problem. Um, and I've heard from Michael that an apartheid regime should end. So when we keep talking about specific violations, then the problem is only these violations. If the violations stop, then we are okay. 
But when we talk about a regime like the apartheid regime, then we are actually uh, addressing the real problem, which is that a certain regime should end. We cannot coexist with the continuation of a certain regime that uh, um, maybe lies to us and tells us that, yeah, he, this regime is engaged with the peace process, so waste our time with that, as Michael has um, uh, said, actually. So, so that's why I think it's very important um, and it's very timely. And I think uh, uh, this report with many other efforts that are going on from uh, uh, the Palestinian civil society, uh, international civil society, regional civil society, uh, are also uh, um, working on the same issue. And, um, and, and I think it's, 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 it's great. So my question here, again, is that is the apartheid regime applicable only in the West Bank? And I like cartoons. This is a cartoon artist uh, who passed away. Um, um, uh, his name is um, Baha Bukhari, who drew this maybe in um, when, when Israel was building the wall. Um, so in, this, in, in the following slides, I'm going to actually just give some examples of what I think are other features of this regime. And I'm starting from the beginning, and we, uh, um, I think, should always uh, try to uh, start from uh, the early stages of the history. Demographic engineering, a term that I actually pleasantly uh, read also in the, in the report, and I've, I've, I've used it before in my own writings as well. Demographic engineering in Israel, as well as uh, in both sides, let's say, of the green line in the, in, 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 mandatory Palestine has been a main feature uh, uh, in Israel. And the idea is that when Israel was established back in, sorry, when Israel was established back uh, in uh, 1947, uh, it was established in the aftermath of uh, a British mandate uh, and a Belfort declaration that promised to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine um, uh, at a time when the Jewish population was a minority in Palestine. Even at the end of the British mandate, the Jewish uh, population was only 30% of the uh, population of Palestine. So um, in order to make sure to build a Jewish state at the time, uh, Israel displaced the overwhelming majority of the Palestinian population, which became, uh, which is an event in the history that Palestinians call the Nakba, which means a, a, a catastrophe. Um, and uh, since uh, the, the Nakba and the displacement of 80% of, uh, of Palestinians, these Palestinians are now refugees in different refugee camps around the world. And then Israel prevented their return since 1947 until today. Uh, they created a specific law called Prevention of Infiltration Law, which actually uh, criminalizes any attempts of Palestinians to return to their homes uh, 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 and then uh, they prevented them from having citizenship. And if you read the Israeli citizenship law, you will see how uh, the Palestinian population who was displaced from the areas that became Israel were explicitly denied from citizenship. And then uh, uh, Israel created an absentee property law, which it used to uh, get as much as possible uh, uh, and, uh, of the property of these refugees, these uh, people who were forcibly displaced, uh, uh, in order to use it for uh, 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 Jewish development and, uh, and interest. Um, so this is uh, one episode of the demographic engineering. Then we, if we look at how uh, 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 Israel ruled the Palestinians since then, we see that it has fragmented the Palestinian population into so many different groups of people. Uh, it fragmented, there is the diaspora, the Palestinian refugees, and those who are unable to return uh, 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 to their homes in Palestine. Then there are the Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, who, uh, while they have Israeli citizenship, they don't have equal rights uh, to the uh, uh, Jewish citizens of Israel. Then we have the people of Jerusalem, who Israel defined as only permanent residents, um, and uh, uh, prevented them many rights, which I will talk about in a later slide. Then, again, there is a population of Gaza, which when Israel occupied Gaza Strip, they uh, 
uh, and East Jerusalem, uh, um, West Bank, and Gaza, they um, actually um, took census in all of these three regions and, uh, and gave different types of residency statuses, one for Gaza, one for the West Bank, and one for uh, Israel, uh, with different colors of ID cards uh, that were given to people at the time. Uh, and then we have the West Bank, uh, which also is another uh, territory uh, that is, uh, um, and the people are um, uh, even fragmented into smaller uh, parts and uh, people are unable to enjoy access to all of the West Bank. Now, movement between these areas uh, needs permits, basically. Uh, if you are from Gaza, you want to be in the West Bank, you need a permit. If you're from Gaza, you want to be in Jerusalem, you need a permit. Um, and in many cases, you don't get that permit. If you are from Jerusalem, you want to marry someone from the West Bank, uh, you need a permit. If you want to marry someone from Gaza, you can't. Well, you can marry them, but you cannot live with them in Jerusalem because the permit uh, is uh, totally blocked. So um, these are only small examples of how fragmented Israel has been uh, cre um, um, or how fragmenting the Israeli policies for Palestinians have been. At the same time, you will not see at all anything similar to that within the Jewish population. If you're a Jewish person uh, with an Israeli citizenship, you have the right to live in uh, any place you like within uh, uh, the areas that Israel considers as part of its own state. But also, you have the right to live in any settlement in the West Bank freely. But not only that, if you are a Jew, but you are not a citizen of Israel, but you would like to immigrate, you have a right uh, that, is, that has no limits to uh, immigrate immediately and uh, get funding from the state, learn Hebrew for free from the state, uh, get oriented to get a job and live anywhere you like, whether in Israel, uh, in the areas that Israel consider under its sovereignty or in the colonies that Israel has established in the, in the West Bank uh, and Jerusalem. So uh, you can see how uh, this uh, image, which, which also we can talk about for hours, um, is another aspect of a bigger domination. The Palestinian people who used to be, who are, I mean, we do define ourselves as one nation, as one people, are fragmented into different, different groups with no right to be together or to travel freely between one space and the other, whereas the Jewish uh, uh, population is totally free. Another example that I wanted to give is um, the Bedouin communities. And this is uh, an example that is applicable in the West Bank, of course. Israel does not recognize uh, um, most of the Bedouin communities' uh, place of residence in the West Bank, despite the fact that many of the Bedouins, for example, this picture is from Abu Nuwar, it's from Jahalin, southeast of Jerusalem. Uh, you can see the bulldozer is, demonst is demolishing uh, uh, a place of dwelling for people. Um, these people of Abu Nuwar are actually refugees who come, came from the Naqab, forcibly displaced in the early 50s uh, to the West Bank. And since then, they have been living in the West Bank. And since the occupation came, it has been displacing them again and again and again trying to concentrate all the Bedouins of the West Bank in smaller areas um, in order to make sure that um, uh, the land is left and is empty uh, for more Jewish colonization and annexation. The same picture can be seen also in the Naqab, Negev desert uh, in the south of uh, uh, the areas that Israel considers part of its sovereign areas. Um, an area that was already conquered back in 1948. And you can see the same, exact same image. Israel does not recognize many villages in that area. And Israel is concentrating the population, or it aims to concentrate the population into uh, smaller townships. Um, so you can see that the same policy that, has applied, that is being applied in the West Bank is also applied for people who might be citizens of Israel even, uh, only because they are part of the Palestinian people. This, um, uh, because also I was asked to talk about Jerusalem and I can see that I still have a few minutes. Um, this is a, 
infographic that uh, a number of civil society organizations, including our uh, Community Action Center and Quds University, but many others with their logos in the bottom of this infographic, uh, worked on. Uh, and it focuses on Jerusalem. And we uh, basically, by this infographic, are trying to uh, show how Israel uh, is working on increasing the Jewish population and decreasing the Palestinian population by a series of measures and laws using the Israeli legal system. Um, and I'm not going to explain all of them because it takes a long time to explain all of them. I'll be happy to share this infographic with Pax if interested and if people ask about it, we'll be happy to share it. But I will only talk about some of them because I said I will at some point. I'll talk about residency. Since Israel defined Palestinians as residents in Jerusalem, um, Israel only gave um, uh, uh, this residency status, which is very easily revocable. Uh, Israel has created many criteria to revoke the residency status from Jerusalemites, including if you travel outside the country for uh, seven years, or if you get a citizenship abroad or a residency abroad, and then they developed it further to become more difficult, saying that if your center of life is outside Israel, then you will lose your residency status. And then they introduced a new criterion. If you breach your allegiance to the state of Israel, then you will lose your residency status. Uh, as part of this uh, uh, policy, uh, Israel has uh, revoked more than 14,500 residences from Palestinians in Jerusalem. Um, of course, this whole issue doesn't apply to the Jewish population. The Jewish population has a guaranteed right. They can live here, live abroad, get 10 citizenships, do whatever they like. They will always have the right to come back according to the Israeli legal system. Uh, it doesn't matter. They can live in the West Bank and uh, keep their status. If I live in the West Bank, I will get my residency revoked. Um, then there is the issue of child registration. Since we are not citizens, we don't pass our status automatically to our children. Uh, and there is a very complicated uh, 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 procedure or rule, uh, a list of procedures uh, on registering children for Jerusalemites. Uh, or for residents, actually. I mean, they don't say Jerusalem, they say residents, but that's the status they assigned us, huh? um, which has left thousands of children unregistered uh, in, in, in Jerusalem. Unregistered means that they have no legal status. They have no right to live legally in, in, in their, in their uh, city, um, that they, uh, they don't get governmental services. They uh, don't get... Uh, medical services, they don't get free schooling, they don't get all of that. But more importantly, when they grow up, if they still haven't managed to register, to get registered, uh, they don't carry an ID card and they are living illegally, they are hiding, uh, they are unable to open a bank account, uh, they are unable to, unable to work, and uh, they live uh, this life of simply hiding uh, um, and unable to... Um, uh, to, and there are many people in, in, in this situation, unfortunately. Um, then we have the issue of family unification. Israel has blocked family unification between uh, the West Bank and uh, uh, Jerusalem and the West Bank, Jerusalem and Gaza Strip. Um, and uh, many Palestinians are living in Jerusalem uh, either without any permit because of that, uh, because I did mention before that you need permits to go from one place to another, which shouldn't be the case in the first place. If you're from the West Bank, you should be able to be in Jerusalem without anything or from Gaza. But the complicated regime system has uh, forced many families to live separately and many families to uh, uh, be unable to uh, uh, live with normal rights. For example, if you have the permit to live in Jerusalem as part of a family unification application, which needs to be renewed uh, uh, constantly, if you are that lucky, you are unable to drive a car, you know. Uh, there are many other conditions, but I'm just giving examples. I will stop here with this infographic and just go to my last uh, two slides very quickly because I have a few seconds left. Um, this, uh, I'm, I'm addressing here then Israel's nation, uh, uh, Israel as a Jewish a uh, nation state or the nation state of the Jewish people. This is a law that was uh, established recently, although it actually 
uh, explains uh, what Israel has been exercising since its establishment. And I'm going to read just uh, uh, Article 1, okay, different uh, elements of Article 1. Article 1a says, the land of Israel, and by the way, when you hear the term the land of Israel, uh, what you should understand is not the state of Israel, it's the state of Israel as well as other areas, including the West Bank and Gaza, uh, but we don't know. It's not a term that has a definition exactly, but it exists in the Israeli law. It certainly includes West Bank and Gaza, but uh, I don't know what else it might include. So the land of Israel is the historical homeland of the Jewish people. So it only talks about one nation, uh, ignoring the Palestinian people, which uh, was colonized um, um, by Israel, in which the state of Israel was established. In uh, Article 1b, the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. Again, it actually tells you what it is, in which it realizes its natural, cultural, religious, and historical rights, right to self-determination. Now, 1c. The exercise of the right to national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. Only the Jewish people have the right to self-determination. And this is my last slide. And in this slide, I'm trying to also, I just gave different examples. And I haven't finished this puzzle that uh, I, I argued at the beginning of this presentation that uh, uh, is, 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 is not complete, of course, by, uh, by the report. But what I'm trying to say here is that the domination and persecution and discrimination uh, of Israel against the Palestinian population is very systematic and it is part of the whole foundation of the state. And uh, that's why it's very important to see this as well. And uh, in order to be able to end this discrimination, we need to, I think, address the nature of the state of Israel as a state that only represents uh, uh, one population and systematically discriminates against the others in order to keep the domination uh, uh, continuous. I think I will stop here and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Monia, for your uh, presentation. Um, I think it was very, um, it gave a lot of insight anyway, um, again as well. Um, very good that you um, included indeed the situation in, in Gaza, in, in Gaza and in uh, Jerusalem especially, and uh, focused on the, the, the topic of the discrimination, uh, the nature of the state of Israel, that question. Um, like with the presentation of uh, Michael, I think you could also uh, continue for another two hours. Um, I'm sure uh, you could. So, but um, first, before we we ask some questions, maybe Michael would like to reply a little bit on the um, presentation of Monir, or do you think we can continue with the questions? I think I think we can uh, continue directly to the questions. I think uh, the two presentations were complementary. Most of us. Of, uh, of them. There are some uh, uh, um, uh, criticisms which uh, I accept, uh, yeah, of course, uh, but uh, I think in the Q&A we can delve more into that. Okay, great. So uh, let's start with the uh, first question. The first question uh, is for Michael. Um, um, one of the attendants asked, um, has Israel ratified the conventions of 1973 and 1998? You know, um, Israel has not uh, ratified uh, neither uh, the Apartheid Convention nor the Rome Statute. It did sign the Rome Statute, but never ratified it. It signed it together with uh, the United States of America. The Clinton administration, on its last day, signed the Rome Statute, and immediately Israel had done so too. And the Bush administration, in the first week of its presidency, declared that it will never ratify the Rome Statute, and Israel has immediately done the same as well. Um, so Israel has not ratified the Rome Statute nor the uh, uh, Apartheid Convention, but um, um, the crime, uh, crimes against humanity are considered customary international law, which means that it, it is binding for all states, it's not only those who signed this. Uh, a, uh, um, a um, treaty that uh, codified it 
And so just like Israel cannot say we haven't signed the Rome Statute, hence we're not committed to the prohibition on uh, genocide, in the same token, it, can, it is bound by the prohibition of apartheid. And I don't think that the Israeli government would ever say uh, the, the prohibition on apartheid does not bind us. They would say it's not apartheid. That would be their line. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, another question for uh, Munir. Uh, you mentioned the word, uh, you were mentioning especially, you were talking especially about uh, Jerusalem um, and, and, and the other areas. Um, but you, you mentioned a lot the discrimination. Um, uh, do you think there had been, uh, there is also, uh, we can also call it apartheid in, in what's happening in Jerusalem, in Gaza, in, in other areas. And what are the implications, whether it's called apartheid or not? And maybe Michael can uh, later respond to this question as well, especially about, um, for Michael more uh, regarding the West Bank, what are the implications, whether it's called apartheid or whether it's not? But let's start with Monir. Thank you very much, and I think this is a, a, an important question, and I'm happy it has been asked because uh, maybe I haven't uh, explained my main message uh, uh, very well. Um, uh, my main message has been that um, Jerusalem, West Bank, Gaza, uh, and the other side of the 1949 armistice line, uh, the area where Israel considers its sovereign areas, uh, are all part of the apartheid regime. So I wouldn't call it different apartheid regimes. I wouldn't say there is one apartheid regime in the West Bank, another apartheid regime in Gaza, another apartheid regime in Jerusalem, and another apartheid regime in Israel. What I would say is there is one regime with all these fragmentations and specialized policies that are being implemented in different areas in this, uh, or different mandates under this regime. Um, how that is useful, and that's very important again, is that, I mean, how, we, how can we use this argument eventually? And the practical use of this argument is that only withdrawal, let's say, from the West Bank will not solve the problem. Only withdrawal from Gaza Strip will not solve the problem. Uh, establishing a Palestinian state somewhere here or there will not necessarily solve the problem. Uh, or, I mean, it's established, but uh, having sovereignty for the Palestinian state that has been established uh, will not solve the problem. My argument is, it's absolutely necessary to end the apartheid regime and have something else instead. We need a, a system that does not look at you with your uh, racial background. And this is regardless whether it will end up with one state or two states. I'm not here in this presentation. I'm not actually arguing in favor of a specific outcome of the conflict. But I'm saying even if the Palestinian state that is under occupation now becomes free, it doesn't mean that the apartheid is over. And it's, we still have an issue with the original, you know, with the Israeli regime as it exists today. So my argument is, we need to work on changing this regime, regardless of whether we end up with one state or two states. So only focusing on that goal of the peace process, which is establishing two states and then we are all happy, I don't think is, uh, is actually uh, enough. Okay, so uh, we do have some disagreements. Um, Munir said that uh, um, in passing that uh, uh, the 1949 Armistice lines is where Israel considers it has sovereignty. Um, well, Israel does consider it has sovereignty, but the international community um, recognizes that sovereignty. So, uh, Israeli sovereignty is there and it is not questionable, at least in the 1949 uh, uh, borders. Um, I have not done a careful uh, study um, of the question of whether um, the reality, the legal reality uh, in Israel itself when it comes to the treatment of Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship um, amount to the, to the degree of the crime of apartheid. I didn't do it, so I will not uh, make any uh, absolute statements about it. But my gut feeling, my uh, uh, legal instinct is that it, it, it does not uh, need the 
threshold, a very high threshold for inhuman acts and systematic oppression and domination and discrimination that is needed in order to, um, uh, to commit the crime of apartheid. Israel has been discriminating systematically against its uh, Palestinian uh, citizens. That's no question about it. It has, uh, in the past, uh, confiscated much of their lands. It has done many uh, crimes against these people, uh, against this group. Um, but uh, in order to uh, ascertain that, it is a, uh, that the crime of apartheid is there, uh, you need to uh, reach a very, very high threshold. And when you have a system where the same laws apply to each, with discrimination in, in some issues, like immigration, very important one, I'm not, I'm not uh, a, a, a disregarding that, it's very important. But, in, but uh, a, a political rights are being, uh, are being conferred on all, it is difficult to say that uh, an apartheid that this is an apartheid regime. Um, if you look at the totality of between the Jordan River and, and the sea, then 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 it's a, a more difficult question. Then it's a more difficult question. But if you look only in Israel, for me it seems uh, uh, difficult to ascertain that it is an apartheid. Now um, the answer to the question, sorry that I've just only now reached it, is that is that. Um, um, the difference between saying that this is an occupation, this is an apartheid, is extremely, extremely important. And I think Munir said it very well in his presentation. An occupation is not an illegal situation. Occupiers might commit crimes within the occupation. They might violate rights of occupied people. But if they adhere to the laws of occupation, then they're okay. Apartheid is not like that. Apartheid is illegit illegitimate and must end. And if international, uh, uh, if, uh, if international, if uh, um, um, states and international organizations agree with the analysis uh, and agree that a certain reality is, is the commission of the crime of apartheid, they are under legal obligation to do anything in their power to end it. Because it's a crime against humanity. It's the gravest category of crimes, uh, uh, second only to genocide. So um, if the discourse on, on apartheid uh, will gain more track, and look, I heard the word of uh, the term apartheid for the first time referring to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict probably in the 20 years ago. And I dismissed it completely. And it was only a handful of very radical Palestinian activists and maybe some European activists, and that's it. Today, it made its way to the center of the progressive discourse, and more than that, the liberal discourse. And the more it will be, become something that people can't escape acknowledging, then it will also be translated eventually to political actions. And the political actions are very clear. If a, if, if a leader agrees, concedes that the crime of apartheid is committed, they just cannot have regular relations with that regime. So that is the, 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 it's not just, we're not academics here. I mean, Munir is an academic, but, but in this case, we're activists, and Munir is an academic activist. And we're, and it's not just a, a, a theoretical or, or semantics. It's about uh, uh, creating obligations on third parties. Great. Thanks for your uh, answer, uh, Michael. That was actually another question as well, a little bit more specific indeed, uh, about the legal obligations for third parties. Uh, maybe uh, Munir wants to touch a little bit on it uh, again as well, on, on the, the obligations of the third parties, what um, the third parties could do and should do. Um, third parties should um, um, take it seriously. Unfortunately, um, what we have been hearing as response to Israel's violations of international law uh, has been in many cases condemnation at best. Um, we haven't seen over uh, the history any practical um, events or actions taken by um, 
most of the uh, or part an important part of the international community more importantly the more powerful the more the wealthier uh, part of the international community in that way i'm referring to you know europe uh, north america um, australia etc uh, these uh, uh, countries, while they, in some times, in some cases, they condemned uh, uh, certain actions, uh, they continued uh, business as usual uh, after the condemnation. Uh, but not only that, they also uh, resisted uh, any uh, measures uh, in the international community taken to uh, hold uh, Israel or Israeli individuals accountable. For example, uh, we know very well that uh, the European Union, for example, has resisted uh, uh, the Palestinian joining, Palestinians joining the International Criminal Court, which eventually gave um, the, the court jurisdiction over, uh, over Palestine. We also know uh, that Israel resists, uh, that the European Union, uh, including yeah, the Netherlands in that case, uh, have uh, resisted uh, the resolution that was uh, issued eventually by the uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, uh, only to list the names of international companies uh, that uh, invest in the West Bank. In the occupied uh, 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 in the in the uh, Israeli colonies settlements in the West Bank, uh, they resisted very hard. Uh, it was impossible to convince them, uh, and they still resist, and they still are against that uh, step. Um, so uh, there are double standards, unfortunately, that we hear uh, from a lot of countries. While they always talk about human rights and international law, etc., but when it comes to real practical steps, even not big steps, see that resolution that I talked about, it's simply creating a list, you know, just publishing a list of companies, names of companies. And they, um, they were totally against it, and they're still, they still are. The European Union boycotts item seven in the Human Rights Council. They don't actually attend the sessions of item seven where Palis the Palestinian uh, issue is, is, is being discussed uh, in the Human Rights Council. Um, so again, uh, what, what can third parties do? They need to take their responsibilities according to international law by not only not recognizing the illegal uh, and the effect of the illegal actions, but also by taking measures. This is part of their obligations according to the Fourth Geneva Convention and according to uh, uh, many other uh, um, measures, uh, m many other instruments of international law. Great, thanks uh, Monir. Um, the next question for Michael. How does the legal definition of occupation and of apartheid apply to area A, which has autonomy and whose population does not have the right to vote? Uh, theoretically, uh, I know uh, elections have, haven't been held in years. So how does the legal definition of occupation and of apartheid apply to area A for Michael? Thank you. So my short answer is that my mayor here in Tel Aviv, Ron Khulbei, has more powers than the president, uh, Abu Mazen. Um, and that the fact that uh, uh, Palestinians can vote, and they for many years haven't, because, mainly because of Israel, uh, but even if they are allowed and, uh, to vote, and this is you know, allowed, that means that someone controls it. But even if they are uh, not they themselves. So even if they are allowed to vote, um, the question is what are the powers of the Palestinian Authority? What kind of issues it governs? Uh, because Palestinians can also vote for their uh, uh, um, you know, uh, condominium uh, uh, committee. That doesn't make them uh, uh, people who have political rights. You should, one should look at the Israeli-Palestinian interim agreement in order to understand that the Palestinian Authority is not a government and that Israel has full control over almost every important issue that uh, uh, pertains to the lives of Palestinians. Uh, entry and exit of people and goods to the Palestinian Authority is completely the control of Israel. 
uh, Palestinian uh, Authority does not have powers in international rela uh, international relations and in, uh, when it comes to security, except internal security. Um, and so the 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 um, effectiveness of uh, the of the uh, Palestinians being subjects of the Palestinian Authority is very very low. It does not reach the degree of being a citizen of a real state. Palestinians, in order to be considered not under the control and domination of Israel, must have real citizenship in a real state. One that has sovereignty that is equal to Israeli sovereignty and to any other sovereignty. This is, by the way, one of the principles of international public law, the, uh, equality, uh, sovereign, uh, equality of sovereignties. And uh, until that time, until uh, 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 we reach that uh, situation where Palestinian government has all the powers vis-a-vis -vis its subjects that the regular government or the regular state has vis-a-vis -vis its uh, subjects, then uh, uh, um, it, it should be seen as uh, Israel is uh, in, uh, in control, uh, effective control over Area A2. Thanks, uh, Michael. Uh, Monir, you have anything to add to this? or? Uh, yes, and I do agree with what Michael said uh, totally, actually. Uh, and I will add to that just an example. When uh, in the last elections, which I actually participated in, uh, it was the first and last elections I ever participated in in my life, in 2006, um, uh, people voted. Uh, in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Jerusalem, etc., they voted for um, uh, the Palestinian Legislative Council. Uh, immediately after uh, the elections were over, Israel arrested many of the uh, Legislative Council members, uh, over 40 of them, and uh, from uh, those who were actually elected uh, in Jerusalem, uh, they have been uh, transferred to the West Bank, forcibly. They had their residency revoked, from Jerusalem, which means that they are unable to live in Jerusalem uh, uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, they are now stuck in Ramallah. They, they, they are unable to return uh, since then. Uh, so it's a joke. I mean, it's a joke to... Um, uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone who knows something about democracy uh, and about political rights knows that it's not only the idea of putting a piece of paper in a box you know, elections. It's, that's not the way you exercise your political rights. Your political rights are exercised through freedom, uh, uh, sovereignty, as, uh, as Michael has actually uh, pointed out, uh, and uh, real independence. But when you, um, when you go uh, waste a day to vote, and then regardless of what the result of that election was, once the, once the elections are finished, um, even the world boycotted the, this uh, uh, government that, was, uh, that came out of the uh, elections uh, because of uh, uh, lack of uh, satisfaction with the results. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not real. It's not real. We cannot talk about it as, a, you know, as political rights. Thank you. Thank you, Munir, for this um, yeah, addition. Um, and the next question is for both of you. Uh, the 2017 uh, Esquire report on Israeli apartheid found that the main tool of Israel's apartheid regime is based in the strategic fragmentation of the Palestinian people into distinct legal, political, and geographical domains and the interactions between these domains. Thus, considering the West Bank in isolation not obscure the true nature of Israel's apartheid regime, particularly as Monir has pointed out that Israel, Israeli apartheid policies and practices exist across both sides of the Green Line and similarly target Palestinian refugees denied their rights, uh, their right of return. So, um, yeah, maybe you can start Monir and then uh, Michael can, can answer. Yes, I mean, I, 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 do, I do agree and this is what I tried to, uh, uh, to present. I, I do believe that... Uh, um, um, Israel has created um, a regime of apartheid. Uh, it has created a situation of uh, Jewish superior superiority over uh, the Palestinian people in Palestine. Uh, this uh, did not start in 1967. It actually started 
uh, as soon as the uh, state itself was established. Um, and it continues until today. And when I mentioned laws like uh, the absentee property law and uh, the prevention of infiltration law and, uh, and uh, you know, the, uh, denying the right of return and all of that, um, I, I do add these as elements in that regime. Uh, Jerusalem, the city in which I live, uh, yes, we, uh, I've talked about so many um, measures that are being uh, uh, conducted for in, in, in the eastern part of Jerusalem where there are Palestinians living. But the western part of Jerusalem, there are no more Palestinian li Palestinians living because they were all displaced back in 1947 to 49 during the war. And even though now the borders between East and West Jerusalem are open because there is no, because Israel annexed East Jerusalem and considered it part of its sovereign areas again, uh, together with the Golan Heights, that is also, Israel considers them part of its sovereign areas. Uh, now there is no borders. Both of them are under the same regime. You cannot claim that your house in West Jerusalem, uh, even if you have all the documents in the world that, prove that it's your house or your father's house, etc. You cannot claim it because you are considered an absentee. If you are Jewish and you live in West Jerusalem and you claim, have a claim over uh, uh, some property in East Jerusalem, you can actually claim it and you can get it. And, uh, 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 and we see that Israeli courts are making decisions continuously uh, uh, giving properties in East Jerusalem to uh, uh, Jewish claimers. So, uh, uh, but then in West Jerusalem, there, there is no one now. It's no Palestinian population at all. So what I'm trying to say is that we cannot say that the problem only starts in 1967. I know that this is appealing uh, to many people. I understand that. Many people who believe that, okay, this is a big conflict. It's complicated. We want an end to this conflict. Let's draw a line and create two states and finish all claims. This is the way the peace process has been dealing with, 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 the, with the issue. But I think it's more complex than that. And we need to, uh, being a human rights academic and activist, again, as also Michael uh, described me, uh, I do believe that it is, uh, uh, it's important to always look at uh, the whole justice question, uh, and not only a fragmented justice question. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so, thank you. Yeah, Michael, yeah. Um, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict and the Palestinian tragedy definitely did not start in 1967. To be precise, it didn't even start in 1948, even before that. But that's not the question. And of course, and, and there will be no um, just solution to this conflict without a, solu a just solution to the refugee uh, uh, problem and to um, the question of properties that were uh, taken uh, by Israel in its first years. But that's not the question. Um, the question is uh, about apartheid. And the wider we make the concept of apartheid, we are risking making it nothing because if it is everything that it, then it is nothing and uh, there are many many crimes that have been committed in the framework of this conflict including uh, a, a possible displacement of masses of people deportations confiscation of lands persecution all kinds of of, of uh, 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 crimes and we shouldn't classify all of them as apartheid. We should look very carefully in order to maintain a serious uh, uh, um, uh, content to the crime of apartheid. If we do not have two racial groups, then there cannot be any apartheid regime. In Gaza, there are many crimes that are committed. Apartheid is not one of them. It's not one of them because an apartheid regime is a regime where you have two racial groups under the same government, under the same uh, uh, laws, under the same, not laws, but the same normative framework. 
And um, and so I, 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 I'm not belittling the gravity of the situation and some of the Israeli action by saying, let's be careful not to extend the term apartheid to include everything. We have other things. Israel has done many things. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that I, that I disagree that uh, the, the crime of apartheid can be examined in a territorial scope that is much larger than the West Bank. Of course it can, but it should be examined if all the, uh, uh, all the uh, uh, conditions are met. Two racial groups, domination and systematic oppression with the intention of perpetuating them, and all of that with hu inhuman acts that are committed with the intention of perpetuating that regime. Israel has, I'll stop here. Thanks, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, I'm afraid uh, the next question will be the last one, unless you're very fast in responding. It's um, uh, to Michael, and I think it might also be interesting to hear opinion of Monir, and maybe also Sharona uh, would like to, to, um, to react. In challenging and countering the regime and crime of apartheid in Palestine, where should Israeli civil society and the international community stand on the ideology behind it? And this, the Zionist settler colonial project, which for more than 100 years has used several tools, including apartheid, to consolidate its control and elimin uh, eliminate uh, Palestinians. So, um, yeah, so the question is, where should Israeli civil society and the international community stand on the ideology behind it? I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, where should the, uh, the Israeli civil society stand is, is, a, is a question that I understand. I'm not... So, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, where should Israeli civil society and the international community stand um, uh, in challenging and countering the regime and the crime of apartheid in Palestine? So I think um, that these are two different uh, parties and they have different uh, uh, roles, I think. Israeli civil society um, is on a crossroad. And Yesh Din, let's talk about it. Yesh Din is on a, in a crossroad because... We cannot conclude that the crime of apartheid is being committed and continue business as usual the day after. It obligates not only third world countries, uh, sorry, third countries, but it also obligates us. It means something about how do we conduct our struggle. Um, we have used to define ourselves as an opposition, opposition to the, to the uh, policies, with critical views about uh, uh, the Israeli government uh, um, um, uh, actions. But uh, an opposition is part of the regime. Opposition is part of the entity, that it took, and it is an internal section of it. Once we defined the regime as an apartheid regime, we are no longer an opposition. We are dissenters. We are we object to the regime, not within the regime. We object to the regime. We want to end it. We say that it is illegal, Ill illegitimate. And how will that be translated into the means of our struggle that is yet to be seen? But I think we are on the verge of many dilemmas. How do we proceed? How do we act if the ICC indeed decides that it has jurisdiction over Palestine? What, what will be our uh, position in, uh, 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 regarding that immense, strategic, tectonic uh, 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 um, uh, occurrence? How, what, what kind of, of demands and asks we have to the international community? It's no longer, let's ask the international community to condemn settlement expansion and to demand that Israel stops doing this or that. It's about ending the regime. So this is a very, very uh, in, a, a big change. It comes at a time when the Israeli civil society, this part of the Israeli civil society, the part that, uh, that uh, 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 struggles to end the occupation is under huge uh, uh, um, uh, crackdown by the government. Um, we have joined our Palestinian brothers and sisters we have had uh, uh, these kind of treatment for years, and we're still much more privileged than them because the type of, uh, of, of uh, uh, 
type of tools that are used against them, such as uh, administrative de detention and, 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 and criminal prosecution, is still not conducted against us, but it is, but it is in the cards. So we will have to, 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 to see how we conduct our struggle from now on. And international community will have an obligation, as both Munir and I said before, to, to do whatever it can and it has several tools in its disposal, including sanctions and other things, to end the apartheid. Okay, thanks. Uh, Munir? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, again, also like uh, what Michael said, international uh, civil society and Israeli civil society are, uh, are indeed uh, different things. When it comes to Israeli civil society, I have been uh, reading their work, uh, following it, uh, websites, etc., following what they do uh, uh, over the past years. And uh, that's why I also said in my first uh, a couple of words that I see this report um, as, uh, as a new important step forward um, uh, for ESD, uh, of course. And um, uh, the Israeli civil society is different. Uh, there are very Zionist civil society organizations that actually are part of the settlement enterprise and all of that. And there are uh, left wing uh, to some extent uh, and some very left wing, etc. So it's, it's a big spectrum, I would say, of, uh, of, of, of civil society. Uh, but then there are also organizations that do work on the, um, on the fundamental uh, issues also. Uh, like Zuchrot, for example, it works on uh, the right of return and all of you know these issues. And uh, in my uh, former experience, I've uh, I've seen that Israeli uh, uh, civil society or like human rights organizations, let's say, not all civil society, but human rights organizations specifically, uh, they have been documenting, analyzing. Uh, 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 advocating against uh, using the Israeli legal system to uh, uh, to defend and to document, and uh, these were of course important uh, steps. Now, if I want to invite them to to something, uh, I would invite for uh, um, taking a more uh, fundamentalist in the human rights sense, <laughs> not in the religious sense, obviously. Uh, a more fundamentalist uh, approach uh, as much as possible um, and uh, to try to do something that would uh, th this type of analysis and even to take it further of course you know the type of analysis that you've done and I think it's a great step forward uh, but even to take it further in order to look at the different elements uh, that uh, of injustice in order to finally be able to uh, uh, reach uh, uh, a situation where um, where justice can be actually exercised by everyone uh, between the river and the sea. So this is to the uh, Israeli civil society. Now, the international uh, uh, human rights organizations, I would actually uh, uh, call them for the same, to uh, try as much as possible to, uh, of course, to look at all the details, uh, but also to look at the big picture. And the big picture is very important um, in order to uh, establish uh, uh, a better situation and to call for the big change rather than the smaller changes only. Thanks, uh, Munir. Uh, Sharona, you had something to add? Um, just in short, one, I think it's a great question, and I think Palestinians will always pay a much higher price for taking action, so it is incumbent upon us to, in our place of privilege, to, as, Michael, as Michael said, to do all we can to end apartheid. And I think for each of us, even within the same organization, that could mean something different. Um, and so I think that we're still determining what that means, um, both as an organization and for each of us individually. Um, and some of us, um, we are doing already all that we can to not cooperate with colonialism and with apartheid. Um, and I would say with the international community, um, in all of our advocacy, we are stressing that they, they know their obligations, that they need to move beyond only 
um, emphasizing the two-state solution and actually um, use a rights-based rhetoric that, and that they would draw red lines and actually um, make it clear what the consequences for those red lines are. And when it comes to apartheid, that it, they need to take whatever actions and tools are available to them to end it. So that's uh, <laughs> in some ways emphasizing what Munir and Michael already said. But. Okay, um, thanks a lot um, to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's an honor. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ipsc.ie forward slash podcast. For more news, analysis, events, and ways in which you can take action, see our website at www.ipsc.ie. Thank you for listening, and you'll be hearing from us again soon.